We are reading pages 44 to 64 of One Amazing Elephant. <clears throat> I'm not in West Virginia anymore. The airplane rises into the sky, and I swear, I'm afraid that I must die. How can all this wait? All these people fly. It's a five o'clock flight. Outside and inside, it looks like night. I'm sitting beside a nice yellow-haired lady with sparkly earrings and a refreshing smell of mint. She swear these cat, uh, cat's eyeglasses with green sequins and a lot of blush, which makes her look excited. She squeezes my hand when she sees how nervous I am, and the skin of her hand is soft like flowers at the end of summer. I'm in the window seat, and she's squished between me and a frowning serious businessman who's obsessed with his work. So Don and I are stuck with each other. She lives in Florida. Was visiting somebody in West Virginia, she says. That winter weather, brr, she says, hugging herself and making it a fake shiver. I know. We're always waiting for summer to come once again. So where are you going, honey? The lady asks. She's holding a magazine and it's open, but she's paying attention to me. I'm sketching in my notebook, which is what I do when I'm nervous. Florida, a place called Gibtown. My father, my grandfather died, so I have to go to the funeral. Oh, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. The old lady pats my arm, which just about does it for me. I have to bite the inside of my cheek and repeat inside my mind, I will not cry, I will not cry, I will not cry. Grief won't last forever, honey, Donna says. It'll go through stages like a roller coaster ride, and you just have to hold on and go with it. I promise, though, that you'll heal one day. It'll never go away, but it will be different. I try to change the subject because talking about death isn't my favorite thing. This airplane is bumpy, I say. I close my notebook and put my pencil in my pocket. The lady is still holding my hand and she's still on the subject of death. So is this your mother's father or your father's father who's passed, she asks. Um, my mother's dad. Your mother isn't coming with you to the funeral? Well, um, she's already there. She's been traveling with the circus since I was three. I get all choked up at the last part of the sentence, and Donna leans over and presses her cheek to mine. Oh, sometimes in life those things happen, she says. We just have to learn to forgive and keep on living. Let go of fear, trust, and everything will be peachy. And if not peachy, at least good enough. Good enough for us. I nod. I glance down at the open pages, Donna's Glossy's magazine. There's a big headline that says, You can do it. Move forward with your love. Spread your wings and fly. That's way too many exclamation points for me at this time of my life. The airplane is landing. It's quivery, and I'm holding my breath, squeezing the seat arms with each hand. Donna circles my wrist, stroking my skin and her fingers. And once again, I have to bite the inside of my cheek. Keep it inside. That's my motto. Coming back to Earth is scary. It's noisy, and it feels like the airplane isn't going to stop. And my stomach drops, and my heart skitters. Donna hands me a little snack pack of peanuts, and I take them, but don't open the bag. Just shove them into the pocket of my jacket. Finally, the plane screeches to a stop. We all unclick our seatbelts, stand, yawn, and stretch. I reach up and grab my small black suitcase from the overhead compartment. My suitcase does not have wheels, because apparently my dad is old-fashioned like that. All I see through the airplane window is darkness, and airport workers and blinking red lights. Bye, sweetheart says Donna. I'll be thinking of you. She hands me a card, a flowery one with her name and phone number and the word spiritual advisor and animal communicator. I read the card out loud. That's an unusual job, I say. Well, people have unusual lives, replies Donna. Like, for example, you. Your mother works in a circus and you have a different living situation. Sometimes people just need some spiritual advice. And animals, well... They need communication, too. I nod. Okay, I say. Call me if you need anything, she says. Here, write down your number, too. She has me write my cell phone number on another of her cards, and then she tucks it in her wallet like something precious. We give each other an awkward quick hug, and I take the phone from my pocket. I text Dag. Here, his tech comes right back, as if he was just waiting for mine. Great. Be safe. Love you. Love you too.
Lugging the suitcase, I followed the other people through a tunnel-like ramp, and when I trudged from the other end into the too bright and busy airport filled with important people coming and going and walk all the way to the baggage claim, there she is, Trulia Lee Pruitt, in the flesh, standing with some bald-headed neck tech tattoo guy. Her hair is dyed blonde, but with roots in the color of mind, and her eyes are lined with so much makeup that she looks fake. Her lips are pink and plumped up. Lily, she calls, waving like Miss America, teetering on high heels. Truly is always a bit more show-offy and fake cheery when she has a new boyfriend. They come running like we're all long-lost friends. And the bald man takes my suitcase. His hand feels rough when it brushes against mine. Hey, he says. I'm Mike. He smells like cigarette smoke, and he's missing some teeth. Plus, he's wearing a dirty white undershirt. But it's pretty nice that he relieved me of the suitcase weight, even if it does mean he has to lift his arm, which results in the disgusting smell of sweat coming from that gross, hairy underarm. My mother gives me a half-hearted one-arm tug. She smells like smoke, too, plus onions. The mothers in my dream world smell like sugar cookies and roses, and they dress snazzy yet classy like the moms in the Old Navy Christmas commercials. This is real life, though, not my made-up one. And Truly Pruitt is wearing a short blue sundress that's like two sizes too small. I can't even believe it about Grandpa, I say. I know, Trulia says. It doesn't feel real to me either. There's a minute of awkward silence. And I can't believe you're 13, Trulia finally says, stepping back to study me head to toe. She hasn't seen me since summer, so I guess I've changed. I'm 12. I'll be 13 in the summer, July 23rd. Julia just brushes it off, as if she forgot my age on purpose. Wow, she says. You sure are getting tall. Taller than me. Yeah, I think that's what happens when you're not looking. Stepping out through the airport, Dower feels the walking into the rainforest part of the little zoo back home, all steamy and heavy and warm. It's as if a damp wool blanket has been thrown all over the world, the whole world, and I break out in a sweat. Cars honk, people hurry, suitcases roll and clatter. I can't even see any stars. The sky is dark. It must be after 8 o'clock, I know, but otherwise I've lost all track of time. There's our car, Julia points to a little beaten up car that's parked all crooked. How far is the trailer park, I say? Not far, says Mike, but there before you know it. The entire time in the car, Julia blah blah blahs in that scratchy cigarette torn voice of hers. Mostly about how Grandpa Bill was just mowing the yard and everything was normal and fine. And then he just went, boom, just like that. I gaze through the window into the darkness. I am the wheels of this car, missing my hubcap. Dad. Queenie Grace is amazing, Julia says. She tried to save Dad. So sad, her voice quivers. The elephant was just following her wild instinct, Mike says, trying to move the body. No, Julia says, her voice firm. She was trying to save my dad. Mike takes a pack of cigarettes from the pocket of his shirt. He shakes one out, taps it against his wrist, driving with one hand. Then he casually sticks that cigarette in his mouth. Um, I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, I say, and Julia turns to look at me as if she blames me for that. I cough just to show them that even the sight of a cigarette can get me going. Uh... I'll save it for later, Mike says, a wisp of annoyance tickling his voice, tucking the cigarette behind his ear. Thanks. Eh, Don't mention it. Truly, it turns around to look at me, grinning as if this new boyfriend of hers is all that. You can take off that jacket, Lily, she says. You're not in West Virginia anymore. I shrug off the jacket. Truly's window is open and my hair blows. The air smells fishy and deep. I'm drowning in neon. Flashing signs Gria saying, drive your own race car and pawn shop and cheap wine and beer. As far as I can tell from here, Florida is not all it's cracked up to be. Do you ever see alligators? I ask. Sure, says Mike. Do you see bears in West Virginia? Mm, Sometimes, I say, if you're lucky. (laughs) Same here, Mike replies. Things are really mostly the same all over, I suppose. We're almost home, Trulia says. There's our landmark, the giant boot. We pass a statue of a gigantic boot. Okay, I say, where is the statue of a boot? 
That's a replica of the original Giants boot, size 22, replies Mike. Your grandfather was related to that guy, supposedly. We're kind of famous in Gibtown, Trulia adds as the car pushes forward. You have big shoes to fill, Ellie, says Mike. The car rattles along a road full of potholes. Gibtown is just a bunch of concrete buildings, rows and rows of mobile homes decorated with Christmas stuff, and lots of junk scattered everywhere. There's a battered little restaurant with signs that says fishing camp eatery and we sell worms. Welcome to Gibtown, says Mike, where life is a circus every day. Hey, says Julia, I grew up here. I love it. I didn't mean it as an insult, Mike insists. In the flicker of some dim street lights, I see an old merry-go-round with a carousel of horses, a Ferris wheel looming up into the night, a couple of lonely bumper cars and an abandoned cotton can stand. Why are there rides? I ask. Do they actually work? Most of them are just stored here, says Julia, old and broken down like most of the people. Mike and Julia crack up. And the animals, Julia adds. Most of them are pretty old and broken too. Well, what kind of animals, I ask. I know I've seen tigers and a bear and some dogs when I go to the circus. Oh, plenty of animals that don't even work in the circus anymore says Mike. There's a couple of ancient monkeys a few doors down, plus these three annoying yippy white poodles that wear tutus. Oh, and there are a bunch of retired leopards. Okay, I say. I hope they're in cages. <laughs> nope, no cages in Gibtown. So it's actually legal to keep big wild animals here, just loose? Yep, says Mike. Gibtown's the only place in America classified as RSB, Residential Show Business Zone. That means circus folks can train grizzly bears in their front yard, keep an elephant, a pet tiger, have a Ferris wheel out back. So do you work for the circus too? Yep. I'm rough. I'm a roofie. I set up the shows and games. Sometimes I work two days straight, then pack up and move on to the next town. Only time we take a break is in December when we all come back here to Gibb Town. Some call it show town. I'll just call it the strangest town in the nation. We have a gas station, library, bar, tattoo shop, grocery store, pharmacy, and a trapeze school. Is there anybody my age? Well, says Julia thinking, there is Henry Jack. He's about 12, I think. His skin is wrinkled like an alligator's. Seriously? I ask. Yep. Mike presses on the brake, which is screechy, and I almost shriek because limping slowly right across the road in front of the car is a lion, a wild lion. There goes good old Boldo, says Mike. Poor thing's on his last leg, so he's pretty slow. Hello, Boldo, Trulia croons through the open window. I watch the lion go, and all I can think is that I wish I were home. The lion disappears, and Mike drives between an inflatable light-up snowman and a big vinyl snow dome that always sways in the night. Here we are, he says. There's the neighbor guy, fire-eating Charlie, just doing his thing. I look to my right, and a man in a cowboy hat is all lit up by a flame sticking a fire. He tips back his head, and the fire goes out. Then he turns to look across the yard, and even in the dark, I can tell that his eye meets mine. I shiver. The fire-eater creeps me out. In the window of the trailer behind him, three white poodles are yipping and yapping, leaping at the glass. Shut up! somebody yells. I look to my feet and there's Grandpa Bill's elephant outlined huge and shadowy against the night. I shudder. Welcome home, says Julia Lee Pruitt. The girl Lily is here. The girl is here, Lily. Bill's little one, the anxious child we see when we're on the road. Wavy hair like the curled, peeled skin of tangerines. Speckled face, Eyes shadowy as a sky getting ready to storm. A sad smell of fear and loneliness. Her heart thrashes hot, get extra hard, and I can't, I can hear it from here. She steps gingerly out into the grass in the back of the car, and the scent is extra strong. This girl Lily does not trust, and her nervousness hangs on her like a ripped dress. Say hello to Queenie Grace, Julia says. You'll probably have to go to see to her because she's not moving. Mm, no thanks says the girl. I'm kind of scared of elephants, you know. Oh, I know, says Julia. And there really is no reason for it. No reason at all. Queenie Grace would never hurt you. 
Mike flicks his lighter, holds a cigarette to flame, puts it in his mouth. He blows smoke. I can smell it. I do not enjoy the smell of cigarette smoke. It smells gray, but not gray like me, gray like danger. This man, Mike, is a threat. The girl does not look at me. She does not speak to me. Lily has hunched shoulders and tired eyes. She carries a thick padded black jacket and heavy fur boots are on her feet. Jeans tight to her legs. She's thin, too thin, legs like sticks. I will paint her one day. And all I will need are lines, slashes and lines, dark, angry, melancholy. Violet bursts through the door. She spreads her arms wide as if to fly. This is the happiest face she has worn in a while. Lily bird, she calls. The girl is not a bird. She does not have wings. She cannot fly. The sky is not her home. And neither is the winter camp. She does not belong here. She is longing for her home, for her family. I smell peanuts, salty, salty peanuts. My mouth waters. I swing my trunk. I sway. I shift my weight. I weave. I heave out a sound and the girl glances back over her shoulder. Our eyes meet, finally, just one glimpse. But then it is time for the people to go inside. This place is crazy. Grandma Violet comes running, bounding along pretty fast for a grandma. She wraps me up in a snug, two-armed hug that feels like love. I must have grown since summer because now her head doesn't even reach my heart. Oh, honey, she says. I hear tears in her voice. I'm sorry about Grandpa, I say, and she really breaks down. I know, Grandma says. Me too. We hug for a long time, and then she steps back, studying me. Lily, my girl, Grandma keeps saying, you are growing up so fast. You've gotten so tall. Inside the trailer, it smells like smoke and socks and old people, plus something like french fries or a hamburger. There's a tree, a green plastic bear one, but nothing else with a hint of Christmas. One saggy green sofa, two black recliners, a tiny red kitchen with a miniature silver refrigerator, pictures on the walls of my grandma and grandpa looking happy and young. There are my school pictures too, framed in gold and old photos of Trulia. There's even a picture of way young Trulia and my dad at their high school prom back before they moved to West Virginia and had me. And of course, there are a lot of pictures of Trulia on the flying trapeze. It's famous. A cuckoo clock chirps nine times. Welcome to our little home, Lily, says Grandma. It's not fancy, but it's ours, and it's a little bigger than the motor home we travel in. My grandma waves her hand, which is wrinkly and spotted brown like most people are who are in their 60s. She's so teeny and fragile. Her purple streaked hair hangs almost to her waist. Grandma Violet's face is crinkly and kind, and she's wearing plaid shorts and red Converse shoes, just like mine, with a black t-shirt that says, be yourself. I have to admit, my grandmother's pretty hip with that purple hair and cool clothing. So how was the flight, Lily Bird? Asked Grandma. Mm, okay, I say. I sat with a nice lady. Her name was Donna, and she wore these funky cat eye glasses, and she was a spiritual advisor and animal communicator of some kind. It's hmm. good, Grandma says. It always makes flying nicer when you have a friend. Plus, who doesn't need a little bit of spiritual advice and communication with animals every now and then? Man, the suitcase is heavy, complains Mike, scrunching up his face as if he's lifting weights. Where can I put this thing? Oh, just set it down anywhere, says Grandma. Make yourself at home, Lily. Our home is your home, too. You can take off those boots, says Julia. You keep forgetting you're not in West Virginia anymore. Mike puts my suitcase on the sofa. Feels like she packed the entire state of West Virginia, he says. Did you pack a swimsuit? Asked Julia. There's a pool. Uh, no, I kind of forgot. It was just so cold when I left home that I didn't even think about swimming. I understand how that happened, says Grandma. It's like when I'm here in Florida, I can't even imagine it snowing and being cold in West Virginia. Two different worlds. How's your father, Lily? Good. He's good. My mother obviously doesn't like talking about my dad. She chews on a fingernail and then she changes the subject. Mom, says Julia, where are the tree ornaments? Where are the lights? I took the ornaments down, Grandma says. I wrapped up the lights. Who feels like celebrating now? That's kind of extreme, Julia says. 
I just needed to do something while you were gone, so I undecorated the tree, Grandma says. But you didn't take down the outside lights, Julia asks. Grandma shrugs. Hmm, can't explain it, she says. I'm just not feeling the holiday spirit. Well, we do have Lily here, says Julia. We could do it for her. No, don't do anything for me, please, because that would mean I have to appreciate, and I'm not an appreciation kind of mood to tell you the truth. This is Christmas Eve, says Mike. You need a freaking tree. I have a dang tree, says Grandma, and that's all I have. They've moved Trulia to the green sofa and Mike to the recliner and given me their room, which really isn't much to brag about. A creaky, whining bed that sags in the middle, a dresser with broken drawers. Apparently everything in this trailer is broken or old or tired or sad. It's only 9.30, but I'm tired. Too sleepy to even unpack my suitcase and take out my pajamas. Flying wore me out. It's like I've left my entire body and half my mind in the sky. I flop into the bed, lying on top of the covers. Grandma Violet made macaroni and cheese with hot dog for my dinner, but I'm still kind of hungry. That's when I remember the pack of peanuts in my back, my jacket pocket. I take out the peanuts, rip open the pack, and a munch a few. But then I get thirsty. I really don't want to go back out and talk to anyone. I decide to just suck it up and go to sleep. I put the pack of peanuts on the top of my dresser. I turn off the lights and through the window, I can see the elephant, a hulking shadow in the night. It's a little bit cool tonight, so the windows are closed. I can imagine the sound of her huffing breathing through. I yank off my jeans, drop them on the floor, and climb once again into the complaining bed, wearing the shirt and socks from this morning. So weird to think that I put these clothes on just this morning at home with my dad nearby. And now here I am, same clothes, same me, same moon overhead, but... Somehow everything has changed. Good night. Going to bed, I text dad, and he texts right back. Sweet dreams. Love you. I wish he was here to tuck me in, to sing one of his silly songs, to read a book with me. I know I'm kind of old for all that, but still, I just really love my dad. Falling asleep, I think I'm a certain, I think I'm in a dream, something about tapping and knocking. Then a crash, a huge splintering sound of breaking glass, and I sit up. It's real. The glass of the window is crashed, a big, jagged, sharp, star-shaped hole letting in a piece of the night. What the? And then I see it, the trunk of the elephant, reaching boldly into the room, eating from the open pack of peanuts I left on the dresser. It's Queenie Grace, and she just keeps eating the peanuts, never taking one eye from my face. I don't know what to do, so I don't do anything. I just sit and stare, knees and blanket to my chin, quivering. The clock in the living room cuckoos 12 times and I reach over and turn on the light. The elephant is bleeding. She has a small spot of blood on her trunk and then it's dipping, dripping onto the broken old dresser in this creepy little room. This feels like a nightmare, some crazy bad dream, but then I know I'm awake because Julia Lee Pruitt busts, hollering into the room. She goes straight to the elephant, never mind me, and then she yells for my grandmother and for Mike. And before you know it, there's a big ruckus going on. I'm watching them all through the broken window, trying not to step in shards of broken glass that fell on the bedroom floor. What are you doing to disinfect it with? Julia asks. Hydrogen peroxide, Grandma says. Are you sure that's the right thing to use? Julia asks, and it strikes me that she worries more about the elephant than she does about me. Yes, Grandma says. I bet it'll burn. Julia says, babe, Mike says, it's an elephant, just an elephant. Chill out a bit, okay? From here, I can see that Julia gnawing on her fingernails again. Grandma pours hydrogen peroxide on the elephant's trunk, and Julia helps to hold it still. The elephant makes noise as Grandma Violet wraps gauze around the cut on its trunk. Mike carries a big chain across the yard. I don't know about that, Mike, Grandma says. Well, we can't have her breaking windows and stuff, Mike replies. Grandma sighs. I can see the rise and fall of her chest with her deep breath. I'm too tired to fight, Grandma says. Mike bends down and ties the chain around one of Queenie Grace's legs, and then he circles a tree with a chain. He knots it tight and steps back, surveying the elephant in the chain. "Mm, That should keep her safe for the night, Mike says, and keep us safe. She only wanted the peanuts, I whisper to myself kind of surprised that I'm feeling half sorry for the elephant. I smell cigar smoke. 
the creepy fire eater is standing outside gawking and smoking. I swear, he catches my eye again, even though the darkness. I look away. The elephant stares at me, too. I know just how Queenie Grace feels. I do. But this much is true, too. I still don't like her. After all, the elephant did try to kill me one time, and she scared the heck out of me back in July. Maybe the chains serve her right. 